Hello and welcome. Uh, this presentation has been put together for St. Anne's 50th birthday. So uh, thank you, St. Anne's, for inviting me to present and speak at your virtual birthday party. And I hope that you and the community that you serve find this of value. So hello, everyone. Uh, my name's James. Um, I'm the founder of My Wishes. My Wishes is a end of life planning platform that enables our community to think about what is important to them and to make plans for both themselves, their possessions, and to safeguard the people and the things that are important to them. Life is precious, and it is important that we spend the limited amount of time we have doing the things we enjoy with the people we care about. This is Kelly. When Kelly turned 18, she set up her free My Wishes account. When Kelly got married, had a child, and bought her first home, she used My Wishes to legally and formally document her wishes. Kelly loved how a fully qualified solicitor video called her at a convenient time to go through her last will and testament. Kelly was able to assign a legal guardian for her child and her dog Bruno. Kelly has now emailed her future care wishes within an advanced care plan to her GP. She has made a log of all her important online accounts within a social media will and she has even left a series of goodbye messages that will be published after her death as part of her ethical will. Kelly's important documents are now safeguarded and instructions for those she cares about have been shared with the relevant people and legally validated. I launched a organization called the Digital Legacy Association back in 2015 uh, at Hospice UK's conference. And the Digital Legacy Association's mission is to highlight the importance of planning for death digitally. So everything regarding our online accounts, so perhaps our Facebook accounts, shopping accounts, uh, cryptocurrency like Bitcoin, the photos, the videos, all of those digital assets that are saved in these plethora of different accounts. As part of the Digital Legacy Association's remit, uh, we run a conference every year called the Digital Legacy Conference. The Digital Legacy Conference is an international conference. It's taken place in London, New York, Berlin, and a number of other regions. If you're interested in, in the Digital Legacy Conference, I'll, I'll go on to speak about that later. I am a digital research fellow for uh, both Michael Sable Hospice and Harlington Hospice. I am a honorary design fellow at the Valindry Cancer Centre in Wales. I sit on the steering group for Compassionate Cymru, which for those of you who are, who are familiar with uh, Compassionate Communities, it's an initiative by the Welsh Government to make Wales compassionate. And I also sit on the Law Society's Digital Assets Working Group. So my story, my dad died. I was transitioning from a Jason Donovan and Carly Minogue fan to Guns N' Roses. And you can see here in the photo, I'm wearing my first ever Guns N' Roses shirt. Uh, it certainly wouldn't ever be the last Guns N' Roses shirt I ever had. He died at a time when music was very important to me. There was an aspect of uh, perhaps losing my, my innocence at, at that time with the death of my father and finding out about a more a darker world with music sung by Guns N' Roses. I have always been interested in, in technology, but I think um, after my dad died, I did think about my funeral playlist. So I thought about my own funeral quite a lot and which songs I'd want to have played that funeral playlist has, has kind of evolved over time, but music, especially the music that would be played at my funeral, was very important to me when I was kind of growing up as something that I would perhaps envisage in, at some point in the future. I worked 
in the technology sector for a number of years. And I was inspired many years later uh, by Bob Monkhouse. But ultimately, I think that the two inspirations for my work was initially the impact of, of my father's death. And then many years later, once I was immersed within the kind of charity and technology sector, uh, coming across a video by, by Bob Monkhouse. Just when you thought it was safe to turn on your TV again, here I am. Gosh, four years already. Doesn't time fly? I wanted to die like my father, quietly in his sleep. Not screaming, terrified like his passengers. The man's accident run. I can still hear the screams. What killed me kills one man per hour in Britain. That's even more than my wife's cooking. <laughs> Let's face it, as a comedian, I died many deaths. Prostate cancer, I don't recommend. I'd have paid good money to stay out of here. What's it worth to you? Bob is, you know, passing down his words of wisdom using the medium of TV. And I thought, well, if Bob can pass down his words of wisdom, now with the internet, we should all be able to do the same. I went about trying to explore how we can pass down our words of wisdom, not using TV commercials, because most of us do not have the ability to do so, but using mainstream communication technologies. I do spend a lot of time raising awareness around the importance of our digital lives and different ways in which we can plan and safeguard different parts of our digital footprint that one day will help inform our digital legacy. As many of you are aware, the way in which we communicate and consume information is changing. Uh, it took the telephone uh, 75 years for 60 million people to use the telephone. It took the internet four years. So within four years, 50 million people globally were, were using it. It took Facebook 3.5 years. Then if we look at some of the innovations that have, have taken place more recently, it took Angry Birds Space 35 days for it to reach 50 million users. And it took Pokemon Go just 19 days to reach 50 million people. So technology is enabling the mass adoption of online services. And these apps and services are increasing both in their influence in our day-to-day -day lives, but they're also having an influence in how we're remembered. Many of us would remember a life before the internet and before we had smartphones and before we perhaps done our shopping online. But we are living in a time of flux where a lot of the physical assets that we uh, have and own are migrating over to the digital side. Our money is becoming digitized and being encased within online only services and platforms. Our shopping is moving online. The way in which we watch videos and movies is now migrating from this physical realm to the digital realm. So instead of owning of the physical assets, quite often we might be streaming those assets. And then the way in which we play is moving from the physical to the digital. So when I was at school, people played Pokemon in the physical realm, but now that's again migrating over to the digital realm. We've got this mass migration of services from the physical world to the digital world. It can create confusion. It can lead to loss, both uh, whilst we're alive, but also once we've died. The digital legacy uh, survey asked the question, how familiar are you with the term digital legacy? 11% or nearly 12% rather said extremely familiar. 36% was somewhat familiar. About, if you look at the chart, about 50% of people were familiar with, with the term. But ultimately, our digital legacy is what remains of us digitally once we die. When we die, our digital footprint can help inform our digital legacy. It doesn't become our digital legacy, but it can help inform our digital legacy. And our digital legacy is becoming important for a number of reasons. My housemate, uh, Ben, died from uh, adult sudden death syndrome. 
And I don't have many photos of him printed. Most of the photos from university, et cetera, uh, were taken on digital devices and photos uploaded to different places. Ben's Facebook account is a important place where photos are stored and I'm able to access those photos and remember Ben as and when I want to do so. Ben's digital legacy is important to, to me. After Ben died, a friend of ours, um, Andrew, created a fantasy football league. The way it works is at the beginning of each season, you get assigned X amount of virtual money. And with that virtual money, you've got to purchase players who you think are going to play well in the premiership that year. And depending on how well they play, uh, leads to an increased amount of points. So for example, if I have Mo Salah in my team and he scores a hat-trick, I get a lot of points for him playing within that game. If I have Wilfred Zaha and he dives and, and gets sent off, then I lose points. This, this league was set up uh, by a friend and this is of, of great importance to me. It's important because we use this as a way to uh, stay connected, so to continue bonds with Ben in a non-morbid, contextually relevant way to us and to the person who he was. Each year, in order to play the league, each person has to pay £20. And at the end of the season, half of that money goes to the winner and half of the money goes to the Ben Birch Memorial Fund as a, as a way in which we can hopefully do some good with the money raised. So this data is from the Digital Death Survey 2020. And again, when we asked uh, if somebody you care about dies, how important would it be for you to be able to view their social media profiles? About 50%, uh, you'd, you'd probably say over 50% placed an importance. 6.2 said very important. 42% said somewhat important. So we've nearly got 50%. This is changing year on year. The next term we're going to look at is digital assets. What are digital assets? Digital assets are possessions that are purchased, stored, or available online. And our digital assets can be held in an array of different places. So an example of a digital asset might be a photo that's been taken on your phone, a song, that you have downloaded perhaps locally to your computer. It might be a home movie that has been saved on a external hard drive. It might be a blog post that you have on your personal blog. It might be a video that you've uploaded to YouTube. Our digital assets can be held in a number of different digital devices and they can be spread amongst a number of different online platforms? The short answer is, yes, they should be included in someone's will. And solicitors, I would say, are becoming increasingly aware of it. We now have uh, textbooks uh, that mention it. We now have precedents that solicitors use for when they're drawing up wills that expressly mention digital assets. So that's, that's really good. Uh, because there is an increasing awareness on the part of solicitors and their clients that these are assets that should be thought about when people are making wills and mentioned in wills. Um, and there are two reasons for that. One is that, of course, we want the right people to end up with the right asset when someone dies, and the person who has died wants their chosen beneficiaries to end up with the right things. And that can be... Uh, digital assets of financial value. James has mentioned Bitcoin. We've got um, financial assets that are held online. Um, but of course, sentimental assets are just as important on death as well. And for some people, even more important than the financial assets, you know, photographs are, are, are very often the most important thing that people want to have to remember their, their loved ones by. So it's important that it's thought about at the will making stage in order to make sure the right people get the right thing. But also it's important so the person making the will has an awareness so that they can leave a trail behind. Because 
the people who have to sort out someone's estate when they've died are the executors named in the will or the administrators if there isn't a will. And those people often delegate that role to people like me who are solicitors dealing with what we call probate. Now, it's a really difficult task to find digital assets unless we know where to look for them in the first place. And very often, the only person that would know where to look for them is the person who's died. So by definition, that's something that needs to be thought of in advance. So if people are thinking about digital assets now, I'd like them to think about, well, who is to have those assets? And let's put that in the will. But also, I need to leave behind instructions about where those assets can be found, because otherwise it's going to be like looking for the proverbial needle in a haystack. So we've got a few things to start to reflect on. If you were to imagine your death, and if you were to imagine the time after your death, perhaps in those hours, minutes, days, months that, that follow, would somebody be able to access your phone book? When I was growing up, my mum used to have a, a phone book next to, a physical phone book next to the landline phone. Um, we used to call that the phone, but now we call it the landline phone. And next to the phone, we had all of the numbers of our aunties and uncles and should something happen, we knew that we could go there in order to find the phone numbers and we could phone whoever we needed to call. That book is long gone. Our phone books have become digitized. They've moved from the physical format to the digital format. If your phone book is perhaps on your mobile phone, does anybody know the password for your mobile phone? Uh, would somebody be able to retrieve the photos perhaps taken on your phone? Uh, and if so, uh, would they also be able to retrieve photos that are saved on your computer or any other devices that you might have? Do they know about perhaps your old mobile phone having photos on it? Do they know that you've got an external hard drive or a different device with personal photos and perhaps videos on? Would somebody be able to read the messages the SMS messages, perhaps the WhatsApp messages, and would you want them to? How will somebody dealing with your online accounts know which photos and videos are of sentimental value to you? How will they know which ones to keep? If you've uploaded photos to places such as Instagram or Facebook, and if you've got photos in an array of different places, how do they know which ones to keep? How do they know which ones you really liked and which ones you'd want to be passed down and to help inform uh, your digital legacy? How will your favorite photos and videos be shared both online and offline? Photo storage, access and curation. So this is a, a quick snapshot. There's over 300 million photos uploaded to Facebook every day. Whereas before we would take photos, perhaps go down to Boots or Snappy Snaps, I think it was called, get the, the, the photos printed in a physical format. They would sit in a physical photo album and they would then be shared or copies would be made and passed amongst the loved ones. With photos becoming increasingly digitized, Photos aren't being printed like they used to be, and instead they reside in a digital format only. Instagram's a good example. So many people use Instagram to take photos, upload them there. And again, before we do upload photos that are, that are taken digitally, they sit on devices that might be password protected. So our physical assets are increasingly migrating over to become digital assets. And no matter what the media tell you, there is no such thing as a digital afterlife or a digital eternity, or you can live forever on the internet. That is simply not true. The only thing that is true is there's different aspects of digital longevity. The longevity of, a, of an asset, whether it's a physical asset or a digital asset, will uh, depend on a number of different factors. It might depend on the sentimental or the monetary value that's placed on it. And then other external factors, as I say, things such as fires, floods, wars, etc. Things that are possibly out of, out of uh, someone's control. Maybe a small child ripping a photo 
etc there's lots of different things that that can change the longevity of of a of an asset now when it comes to a digital asset you have a element of control over its digital longevity but you certainly don't have total control over its digital longevity if you were a user of myspace you will remember it as being one of the early social networking sites there was something called the myspace generation and bands artists individuals etc would create a myspace uh, it was owned by microsoft and it was bought out by a couple of different individuals and companies since but ultimately people such as britney spears the spice girls etc used myspace to engage with uh, their fans and an audience develop an audience a few years ago myspace were updating their server so they were moving the data from one location to another and they lost a lot of data people who were perhaps expecting their myspace account just to sit there and to reside there had that data removed from the records forever i remember the first time i went to see dr john troyer he's a professor at bath university and somebody who i've worked with on a number of occasions over the last few years probably the first time i ever saw him speak john mentioned that the headstone is a technological innovation it was really thought provoking the the humble headstone been used for a millennia and uh, and beyond and technology is used and will continue to be used and there will always be a transitional periods where aspects are a taboo so whether it's embalming or remembering somebody online or having a memorial site our relationship with with these uh, different technological innovations will will change evolve and alter some of the things that is probably worth exploring very very quickly is our relationship with death is changing in relation to how we learn about health conditions and specific treatments that might be available we've got an array of medical and assistive technologies that can enable longevity improved comfort and diagnostics and these are changing and evolving all of the time we've got technologies that help us plan for death and we've also now got technologies that can help us remember a loved one an engraved ring is a technology that helps us remember a loved one a electric needle that's used to have a memorial tattoo uses a technology to help us remember a loved one and something that i've looked at and explored during the covid pandemic is being able to say goodbye virtually saying goodbye can take many many different forms at the start of the pandemic i wrote a piece for the bmj the british medical journal about how skype and other video calling technologies can be used for people to be able to say goodbyes it was a, a very kind of quick framework that was peer reviewed by Dr Mark Talbot and we tried to highlight that with social distancing and with people dying in hospitals and at home and not being able to see their loved ones there should be a way in which healthcare professionals can assist people whether it's in person or remotely enabling these goodbyes to be to be said saying goodbye at funerals is also very very important in the uk we had social distancing and still have social distancing measures at funerals that limit the amount of people who can attend i wrote initially a tutorial um at the time not many funeral directors were enabling their clients to have video streams especially when it when they weren't taking place in crematoriums and this was almost like a do it yourself tutorial for both the bereaved who might want to use facebook or zoom to stream uh, their loved one's funeral but it could also be used as guidance for funeral directors who didn't have uh, video streaming partners in place enabling people to be able to say goodbye virtually if they were unable to do so physically in in, in the present we found out that 
many funeral directors were not speaking about virtual funerals and video streaming with the bereaved and providing it as an option. We wrote a a framework for funeral directors. To this date, there are no funeral director organisations in the UK that have virtual funerals included within their code of practice or uh, within their duty of care. It's something that the Digital Legacy Association continues to highlight and flag. Many funeral directors do provide video streaming for their clients. The Digital Legacy Association, however, argues that funeral streaming and virtual funerals is very, very important now, and it should be included within best practice guides. So we've created a very, very simple best practice set of guidance for funeral directors to help empower them to provide virtual funerals for bereaved families. Influencing your own legacy. Before we move on to the practical aspects and step-by-step guides as to how you can be empowered to make plans for yourself, your loved ones, and your assets, I thought it'd be worth putting together a few bullet points to think about your own circumstance and just to lead to a little bit of self-reflection. The things that you do during the course of your life will ultimately be your legacy. It will be your legacy and it will inform your digital legacy. The two are not mutually exclusive of one another. If you're known as a funny and happy person in in life, uh, that will inform your legacy and it will also inform your, your digital legacy. Carrying out altruistic tasks. So these include will writing, advanced care planning, funeral planning, etc., they themselves can all have a positive influence on your legacy. By making plans and trying to relieve the impact of of your death on your loved ones, carrying out these altruistic tasks can, again, help enhance your own legacy. You are able to have an influence in your own digital legacy. So you can remove perhaps hurtful comments that you might have posted online, If there's some embarrassing photos of you, perhaps from university or something that you've been tagged in, you can untag yourself, etc. So you can influence your digital footprint when you're alive. And as mentioned earlier, your digital footprint will eventually inform your digital legacy. If you wouldn't let somebody curate your printed photos and your photo albums, why would you let somebody else curate your digital photo albums and your online content? There's an array of different organizations who will say, oh, we can manage your online accounts. We can do this. But when you dive into what's actually in those online accounts from both a sentimental aspect, but then also a monetary aspect, the best person to look after your digital estate is you. You need to be empowered. You need to get your home in order. If you don't and you leave it to somebody else, you don't know what will be kept and what will be thrown away, what will have longevity and what will be destroyed. Everybody needs to take ownership of their physical lives and their digital lives as well. This brings us on to the next section of the presentation, which is my wishes. My Wishes mission is to utilize technology in order to help normalize end of life planning. It's a free to use platform that helps demystify care planning and end of life planning. It makes it free, it makes it accessible. It's a technology for good innovation and it enables our users to make plans for themselves and their loved ones from from anywhere. It's an online platform. You create the content, you then download it, print it, share it, and it's done. And once you've carried out these tasks, you can do the most important thing, which is enjoying life. When it comes to making plans, the platform allows you to write your will, uh, document your funeral wishes, state what you'd want to happen in the future regarding your health and social care within an advanced care plan. If you are in a wheelchair and you've had a postural care assessment, it enables postural care planning. 
if you use digital accounts such as Facebook, Twitter, Amazon, all of these different online accounts, you can document what you want to happen within a social media will, which is also sometimes called a digital will. You can leave goodbye messages. So in a similar way to a Victorian memory box, you're able to say goodbye to your loved ones in your own time, in your own way digitally. There's a range of different tutorials and ways in which we improve people's learnings through different publications and resources. And then there's also different bits of information and signposting. We're now going to go through and do a live demo of my wishes going through each of the sections step by step. Once you've created an account on my wishes, you will land initially in the my profile section, and then you will go through to the dashboard. On the dashboard, there's a step by step tutorial, there's resources, there's a dynamic feed of uh, relevant news that's came in from my wishes and there's a number of different tutorials published the first section we're going to look at is the last will and testament section this is very very simple you asked a number of questions you know they're dynamic they expand and once you've created your last will and testament, simply download the documentation and sign it. It needs to be witnessed by two people. You then have got a last will and testament that is legally binding, that states what you would want to happen to your estate. This is the funeral wishes section. Here you've got your main funeral wishes. You've got your funeral playlist. So if there's songs that you want to have played at your funeral. And you've got the My Obituary section, which enables our users to upload goodbye videos to be played at their funeral. Here, for example, here's one I created earlier. I've got my obituary funeral message. There's a unique code that's paired with the message. I've sent, said my goodbyes. And when I die, this message is, is able to be sent out and I'm able to influence my funeral. In the funeral playlist section, I'm able to say which songs I want to have played. So in this example, I want uh, Daft Punk Around the World to be played. And I'm able to actually tweet this and share this information now. In this circumstance, I've added Daft Punk around the world. I have made my, my wishes handle public. When somebody clicks through on the Twitter link, they're able to go directly to my funeral playlist. Here, they will also be able to see my bucket list if I've made it public. A bucket list is a list of things that you want to do or achieve before you die. For example, I have played the guitar in public. I have not achieved visiting Bali. Recently, due to lockdown restrictions being removed, I was able to get a haircut. So your bucket list can be fun. It can be serious. It can be whatever you want it to be. The next section we're going to look at is advanced care planning. So it's important that we all think about the kind of care that we would want uh, should something happen to us in the future and should we be unable to articulate our wishes ourselves. An advanced care plan can be updated at any point during the course of your life, but it states out what you would and would not want to happen in the future should you lack capacity to be able to articulate these wishes yourself. Again, you create the documentation, you download your advanced care plan. There's a set of instructions to follow, uh, but ultimately, once your advanced care plan has been created, it can be shared, it should be discussed. So you might want to discuss it with your loved one. If there's somebody involved with your care, you might want to also discuss your wishes and why you've made those decisions. The next section we're going to look at is the goodbye messaging feature. This is very similar to a Victorian memory box. 
You can leave messages for your loved ones. It's very, very simple. You write a goodbye message. Once it's been created, you assign a trusted contact. So your trusted contact might be your partner. It might be a family member, a friend, etc. And your trusted contact is unable to view your messages. They're unable to edit your messages, but they are able to administer them in accordance with your wishes after your death. You're able to also create a series of scheduled messages. Again, these can be sent out following your death on specific dates. So if we bring the activity log open, you can see I've created my first goodbye message. And then I've got two scheduled messages here ready to be sent out in the future. Your goodbye message will be sent out immediately after your trusted contact confirms with my wishes that you've died. Once that happens, scheduled messages that are due to be sent out in the future are sent out on the specific times and dates in accordance with your time zone and in accordance with your wishes. Any scheduled messages where the time may have elapsed. So if, for example, I'd created um, a video, let's say that was or a message that was happy birthday, Ed, and it was due to have been sent out three weeks ago. These are sent out once a week until that backlog has been has been cleared. So messages are sent out in accordance with our wishes on the scheduled times and dates unless they're backlogged and then they're sent out once a week to ensure that messages are not lost. The next section we're going to look at is the online account. So this is really the social media will or the digital will section. You state what you want to happen to each one of your online accounts. They're broken down into verticals. So you've got your media accounts, you've got your online shopping accounts, financial accounts, etc. When you've got accounts that falls outside of these verticals, you can add it into the my other accounts section. So if I scan across here to my other accounts section, you'll see that I've got a PlayStation account and I've got Bitcoin held in Coinbase. Once again, my digital will, as with the funeral wishes, the last will and testament and the advanced care plan is downloaded. None of this information is of any use or relevance if it's behind a password that nobody knows. Once it's downloaded, of course, sign the documentation. Some of your wishes might be legally binding. Some of them might not. It will be dependent on each of the platforms that you use. But by creating a log, by creating a document, it will provide guidance for both your loved ones. And it will also provide clarity to any service providers and platforms as to what your wishes were. There's a whole learn section on my wishes, learn.mywishes.co.uk. Here you'll find a range of different tutorials, such as the one mentioned earlier about how you can arrange a funeral. And we also explore how different platforms can be used for remembrance. This is a banner I have both on my My Wishes profile, but also in Facebook. Click on the download button, and this could be used as part of my digital legacy because I have obviously vetted this photo. I've included it on Facebook. I've made it public. For me, I would be happy for this to be used. So we highlight all of these different things within the learn section. We have a blog section, free to use leaflets, which can be freely downloaded from my wishes. We run different innovative campaigns, again, exploring how technology can be used to improve aspects of end of life. Recently, for the National Day of Reflection, we created a series of virtual candles. Candles can be dangerous. They aren't available to everyone. and Ahead of the memorial, the doorstep memorial, we published and made a suite of candles available 
that could be put on window ledges safely. They could be used by children. They could be used in care homes. So again, we use technology to help enhance aspects of remembrance and end of life. few final things to think about. Think about the things that matter to you. What plans do you need to put in place to ensure that your wishes are met and that they are adhered to? How will you ensure that aspects of your digital life will be accessed or deleted upon your death? And who do you need to talk with? Everyone has a digital component to their lives. And I think as, as a consultant, I'll see a certain number of people. I work within a team. Everyone has a role alongside everything else. They should be nudging people about they see, whether you're a GP, a district nurse, or you're working with someone socially, or you're a volunteer. We all have a role to prompt people to try and plan ahead for these things. I think one of the things I want to promote and more normalise is normalise the fact we're all mortal, normalise the fact you need to plan ahead, and it's, it's my current mantra of you plan and forget. And so digital planning is as important as any other part of the planning. You file and forget. You put it away. You make it, you make it available. You make it foolproof. It's going to be stored online. So let's be fair. If you're going to store things online and instructions online, you need to make provision to have access to all the things you store online. So as a group of professionals and the broader you get, we all have a role to play and we should all be promoting it and normalising it as a thing we should all do. If you want to learn more, mywishes.co.uk website, there's information on the Digital Legacy Association site. There's more information. There's links to free resources, including a framework, a conversations framework. There's a wonderful podcast that included me, the bereavement lead, Elaine Casket, and Lucy Watts, who is the head of lived experience for My Wishes, with Jane Bakewell, the host of We Need to Talk About Death. And this BBC podcast is really, really good. It's one of the most in-depth explorations of, of digital legacy that's, that's available. The Digital Legacy Conference takes place every year. This year, it's taking place as part of the European Association of Palliative Care World Congress for the second time. Uh, it's free to attend if you have an EAPC pass. If not, it's £30 via the Digital Legacy Conference website. So please, if this is something that's of interest, we're going to be streaming it live from Michael Sobel Hospice with contributors from all over the world. So if you're able to attend, please, please do so. We run training courses. So if you want to explore digital legacy in more depth, whether you're a healthcare professional, social care professional, legal professional, funeral professional, please do get in touch. Thank you for watching this video, possibly in its entirety. And I just thought it would be worth closing with a few kind of things to take away. So first of all, perhaps sit in silence, reflect, 
think about all of the different online accounts that you use, what media and what content is contained with each and how you might go about starting to make plans for them. Learn about the different platforms that you use. So learn about the what you can and what you cannot do within each. And that will be dependent both on uh, UK law, but it will also be dependent on the terms of service of each of those platforms. Uh, think about how you might share passwords or grant access to your own accounts to somebody else. There isn't a right or wrong way of doing this. It's dependent on each person, each platform they use, uh, their relationship with their next of kin or their loved ones, and then also their, their relationship with technology. Once you're in a position and once you've thought about these different aspects, document your wishes within a digital will. And as we mentioned earlier, sometimes that's also referred to as a social media will. That will provide um, awareness about the different accounts that you own uh, to your next of kin and what your preferences are for, for each. And hopefully that will help to both reduce the stress and the anxiety following your death on the person who is dealing with your digital estate. And it will also ensure that data, photos, videos, memories are not lost. Uh, delete photos um, and videos perhaps of you that you wouldn't want to remain online after you've died. And you wouldn't want to uh, inform your digital legacy. Um, as well as carrying out this task, you might want to delete any messages that you might have posted uh, on social media sites, um, if you've got perhaps an old blog that you no longer use. And again, you wouldn't want to inform your part, well, you wouldn't want it to inform your digital legacy. Again, consider deleting that um, so that it, it's no longer live online. Uh, if you haven't written a last will and testament, uh, you should. Uh, everybody over the age of 18 in the UK should write a last will and testament. Within it, include your digital assets of a monetary value um, and also some of the uh, digital assets that might be of a sentimental value as well. So it's important that um, no matter what you know we've got, you know, whether it's a lot of money or a lot of assets or something very, very small, um, just by documenting what is important to us within a last will and testament, again, legally, it can ensure that your wishes are adhered to. Think about printing your favorite photos. So we're creating uh, more and more photos as we've kind of explored uh, over the last 50 minutes or so. And by printing it out, the longevity of that photo um, may be increased dramatically. You might, once you've printed the photos, want to write stories around or on the back of the photo to ensure that, um, you know, the story around that content um, and that memory lives on. You might want to email a group of photos, so maybe 10 or 20 photos uh, to people who are close to you so that they know which photos are important to you and why they are important. Um, and finally, revisit these tasks when your life circumstances change. So perhaps when you create a new account that becomes of value to you, whether it's monetary or sentimental, when relationships with people change and when you feel you know, you're ready to, to revisit this, um, and update your content. Happy birthday once again, St. Anne's Hospice. The work that you do around the Manchester region is amazing. Um, I'm delighted to have been and honoured to have been asked to contribute. I hope that you and your wonderful community have found it of value 
and I look forward to seeing you all back in person very, very soon. Take care. Bye-bye.